uh, Joan Lester is going to talk in the place of Bob Layson that was uh, advertised because Bob sadly is, uh, is in hospital, for, hopefully for a short time. Um, and he's going to talk, Joan's going to talk on what's wrong with, what's wrong with libertarianism, a reply to an article of that name by, uh, by Jeffrey Friedman. I never thought you'd get that right. And I deliberately write them like that to catch you out. You've been... And did you catch me out? No, I didn't. <laughs> I but you've been practising. Anyway, <laughs> no, this is... Um, <clears throat> I did mean to revise this a bit, um, having spent the entire day fixing a crash computer. I just had time to quickly go through it. I did mean to look out for any other more recent relevant articles. Uh, after writing What's Wrong with Libertarianism, Jeffrey Friedman went on to write about post-libertarianism and post-libertarianism is not libertarianism and what is all this libertarian rubbish anyway? I, I might have made that last one up. But he is really anti-libertarian. Uh, that's one of his big things. And he, as editor of Critical Review, would write... 90, 120 page articles criticising libertarians and why they... You know. Anyway, and on the basis of that, I read a lot of these long, long articles. And uh, on the basis of that, I wrote this, or I was prompted to write it. But anyway, uh, it should just take 20 minutes. So some years ago, I was a reader and then subscriber of Critical Review. I read... <coughs> several of Jeffrey Friedman's series of articles uh, critical, of libertarian, critical of libertarianism in that periodical, of which he was coincidentally the editor. I noticed that Friedman made two key philosophical errors repeatedly concerning the libertarian conception of liberty and uh, his epistemology. Eventually I submitted a response explaining my criticisms. But I was told by him in a letter, and I paraphrase from memory, that the periodical will now be moving away from philosophy and into public policy. And so, if only for this reason, he would not be publishing my submission. As I suspected that his own philosophical errors would continue unabated, I found this unsatisfactory, and I had it in mind to reply somewhere or other eventually. <clears throat> Friedman's later article, uh, what's wrong with libertarianism, but this is 1997 now, summarises his objections to libertarianism and in the process repeats the errors uh, to which I had objected. Hence it seemed a suitable target for a short restatement of my criticisms as they were quite different from those of other replies the article had received. And as Jeffrey Friedman still seems not to have changed his mind since. Unfortunately, the article uh, appeared in Liberty with an additional introductory paragraph uh, criticising Jeffrey Friedman personally and Critical Review, a paragraph that I had not written, agreed to or even seen, apparently written by the uh, then editor, now deceased, who had um, some dislike of Jeffrey Friedman. So I wish to record that only the following text, give or take a word or two, is what was ever submissioned or fully sanctioned by me. Many people that take a scholarly interest in libertarianism undoubtedly read Jeffrey Friedman and presumably he persuades some of them, particularly, I suppose, his students, to his anti-libertarian views. I, th I think he's certainly worth answering. Uh, though plenty of other people have replied to him before, I don't think any of them have really hit him uh, in the appropriate place, as it were. So, in What's Wrong With Libertarianism, Friedman criticises libertarianism as he understands it, usefully focusing on two key points. That libertarianism is empirically unjustified and really held for inadequate philosophical, 
that is, a priori, reasons, and that libertarians cite empirical evidence in favour of libertarianism, but ultimately fall back on the a priori reasons. Friedman calls the attempt to be both a priori and empirical the libertarian straddle. I should say immediately that I believe that some of Friedman's criticisms correctly identify errors in certain versions of libertarianism. These versions are overly a priori, or they are confused as regards the conception of liberty. However, these other criticisms are mistaken. They are justificationist, demanding an impossible epistemological support, or misunderstand the, li the libertarian conception of liberty. Ironically, these show Friedman to be guilty of an a priori anti-libertarianism, and he is also guilty of an anti-libertarian straddle, whereby he wants to cite evidence against libertarianism, but what can always fall back on its lack of justification and its supposed conceptual unclarity. Thus, I contend that the most extreme version of non-justificationist libertarianism, uh, understood as minimizing proactive constraints or impositions or some such formulation remains an unscathed conjecture. Friedman's article is quite lengthy at almost 25,000 words. I can uh, usefully reply in about a tenth of that. This is partly because of his oft restated criticisms of a prioristic libertarianism and the inadequacy of some accounts of libertarian liberty and I don't need to defend those. Uh, it's also partly because his oft restated justificationist criticisms and his error about the correct interpretation of uh, libertarian liberty, but I can reply to that without tackling every single one of them because he does go on ad nauseum about it. Friedman begins his abstract with the assertion that, quotation, libertarian arguments about the empirical benefits of capitalism are, as yet, inadequate to convince anyone who lacks libertarian philosophical convictions. This assertion is itself empirically false. Many British libertarians, including me, were converted uh, and some of them from socialist ideologies at the time, though I wasn't actually a socialist at the time, by arguments about the empirical benefits. Even if there are no similar American libertarians, which I doubt, I am led to be, believe that Jeffrey Friedman knows some of the British ones. However, there are always larger than normal conjectural leaps in a change of ideology that a justificationist uh, such as Friedman, Friedman might construe as being due to libertarian philosophical convictions. What happens is uh, I had a lot of empirical problems and when these had been answered to my satisfaction I couldn't think of any more empirical objections. I leapt to the conjecture, oh well, maybe the government doesn't do any good. It was a conjecture, but I was fully aware that it was conjecture. My criticisms have been answered. Libertarianism hasn't been supported, but my criticisms have been answered, and criticisms of statism uh, seem to stand, and therefore statism seem to be refuted. And I think that's how it works for a lot of people. When Friedman writes of philosophical libertarianism, he means only an a prioristic version that does not require empirical input. In reality, much or even most libertarian philosophy is intended to complement empirical work. It might be less confusing if Friedman had written only of a prioristic libertarianism, which is a different matter. After examining the arguments in several libertarian books, Friedman concludes that libertarians do not yet possess, sorry, this is, libertarians do not yet possess an adequate critique of government interference in the economy. A critique, that is to say, 
that establishes not only why the state should be kept on a very short leash, but why it should be emasculated. Page 408. I'll give the page numbers just in case. This is in the uh, critical review. The use of establishes betrays Friedman's justificationist epistemology. As Karl Popper's Christa, uh, critical rationalist epistemology explains, it is illogical to suppose that universal theories can be established with finite evidence, even if such evidence were not itself conjectural, which it is. But that does not mean that we cannot validly advance bold universal conjectures that we test as best we can. However, Friedman combines his epistemological error with other philosophical ones that reinforce it, as we shall see. Friedman thinks that a purely consequentialist empirical libertarianism could, on its own, largely accept as valid the meliorist aims listed by Cornwell, challenging mainly whether the state is capable of achieving them without causing even worse problems. 409. But when libertarians have read of research and economic theory that appear to refute all the assertions that the state is the solution rather than a, the problem, it is hard to see how they could how they could see any list of meliorist aims as being other than due largely to empirical misunderstandings. It would be equally presumptuous for libertarians to assert that purely consequentialist empirical anti-libertarianism could, on its own, largely accept as valid the meliorist aims of libertarianism, challenging mainly whether the market is capable of achieving them without causing even worse problems. In other words, just inverting what he said. Justificationism again arises in the statement that libertarian conclusions require not only extensive evidence of government failure, but an empirically substantiated reason to think that such failure is always more likely than the failure of civil society, 410. Because by civil society, he doesn't really mean what I would call civil society, which is non-political society. He means to tie civil society to politics. And it's a, a politicized view. I think that's a misconception of what civil society is. An empirically substantiated reason, especially that something is always more likely, is not an epistemological possibility. How could such a universal theory be shown to be true? But a critical preference for a conjecture is possible. In order to maintain a critical preference for the libertarian conjecture, one only need refute putative examples of government success and uh, criticisms of the libertarian alternative, of course. Friedman's main criticism of the market, for he focuses only on this aspect of libertarianism, this is the thing he particularly hates. He doesn't necessarily uh, object to the personal aspects of it, of libertarianism, is that there is no guarantee that it, that it is and will always be better than state intervention. As this is an impossible demand, and one to which uh, John Gray has also succumbed, uh, this criticism amounts, ironically, to a kind of philosophical anti-libertarianism, more precisely, a prioristic anti-libertarianism. This is every bit as erroneous as the so-called philosophical libertarianism that Friedman is attacking, but which I think very few people, in fact, hold, though some libertarians do. But now consider the other main issue, from my perspective at least, that Friedman raises. Does the state deprive people of freedom or liberty? Friedman thinks that it does because he misunderstands the libertarian conception of interpersonal liberty, as do many libertarians themselves, and some of them are professors 
who are libertarians, as involving the absence of coercion in some sense. Uh, as I mentioned in a previous talk, people do still talk about coercion. Now, when they talk about coercion, they mean uh, not what the English word means, the, the use and threat of force. They mean interfering with somebody's legitimate property. So, so what they're really are complaining about is interfering with somebody's legitimate property. And what they mean by legit, anybody might say they're against interfering with somebody's legitimate property. So what they mean by legitimate property is legitimate property which is libertarian. They don't really mean anything about coercion at all. And they don't really mean anything about aggression when they, when they try and use aggression instead of coercion. They mean interfering with the legitimate property which is libertarian. But why is it libertarian? Because we say it is. Because they can't explain what it's got to do with liberty. And that's the problem. But Friedman, and I don't think he's being disingenuous, just takes libertarians literally when they say they're against coercion. Uh, it seems fair enough to take people literally and then they have to try and explain themselves better. Uh, as all property systems use coercion to enforce themselves, and they do, he is able to conclude that strictly in terms of negative liberty, freedom from physical coercion, Libertarianism has no edge over any other system, uh, 428. And of course, he's completely right. However, an analysis of the libertarian conception of interpersonal liberty shows it to really be about uh, people not proactively constraining each other in some way and nothing to do with coercion or aggression or anything else and uh, some more direct route uh, and the intuition libertarians have, but which they then uh, confuse by not talking about it explicitly. And they've confused uh, Jeffrey Friedman, as also I think they confused G.A. Cohen, who, who similarly had a, an idea of, you know, if you're not interfering with me physically, I'm free. And that's the idea of freedom that he went along with. You can't blame anti-libertarians for being confused about liberty when so many uh, libertarian philosophers, let alone ordinary libertarians, are confused about liberty. And so I don't blame Jeffrey Friedman. And all property assignments, including that of self-ownership, I should say, are derivable from a proper conception of liberty. Thus, Friedman, Friedman errs in concluding that Bose is mistaken in describing taxation as aggression against the person or property of the taxpayer because the social democratic baseline is inherently proactive in its impositions and so does flout libertarian liberty. I cannot usefully summarize all relevant arguments here. However, once one grasps that liberty is about uh, people not proactively constraining each other in some way, one can easily understand uh, the general dangers of infringing such liberty and why the onus of the argument ought to be on those who want to infringe on such liberty rather than those people to explain what, why they should be left alone. Having mistakenly discussed a Hobbesian zero-sum Friedman freedom instead, I'm getting as bad as him, Friedman decides that it is better to choose positive freedom, which is the ability to attain a goal we choose, 431. As this is clearly about want satisfaction, I see it as a kind of welfare rather than any kind of liberty, uh, though it does not matter much what terms we use. Friedman then suggests that the social democrat wants to equalize positive free freedom 
but more rigorously than does the libertarian. The libertarian doesn't want any such thing at all. He wants to maximize interpersonal liberty. He might well think, as I do, that this will also maximize want satisfaction or preference satisfaction, sometimes known as preference utilitarianism, but to equalize the ability to attain a goal we choose has nothing to do with libertarianism as such. Friedman's view that libertarians would arbitrarily extend positive liberty only to those who happen to have acquired title to pieces of the world is confused just because libertarians typically suppose that libertarian private property clashes less with getting more of what you want than any known alternative. And Friedman, as usual, offers little argument or evidence to the contrary beyond mere logical possibility, which is, of course, part of his a prioristic anti-libertarianism. Nothing that uh, I've written so far entails that the libertarian conception of liberty is intended to be the correct conception of liberty or the essence as Friedman accuses libertarians of intending. But there is something that libertarian liberty is, and it is not what freedom, Friedman supposes it is. Nor is it advocated for the reasons he supposes. So Friedman is mistaken in his assertion that the assumption that liberty is embodied in the libertarianism embodied in libertarianism relatively more than in any other system is necessarily false, however, unless we are speaking of positive liberty. For liberty, as the essence, uh, sorry, as the absence of uh, proactive constraints or some similar formulation, uh, is necessarily more embodied in libertarianism. So with my preferred version of libertarianism, I can accurately invert Friedman's charge thus. The way anti-libertarianism incorporates consequentialist and philosophical argument feeds on and breeds complacency at the same time, simply inverting what he says about libertarians. Instead of complaining that the consequentialist libertarians do not yet appear to have established a valid reason why government intervention in a free market economy might not sometimes be better at meeting human needs than laissez-faire, when such a reason is logically impossible, why does Friedman not attempt to give what is logically possible one real example of government success? He surely does attempt to do this on other occasions, but not in this 25,000 word article. But when he does uh, uh, attempt any reply to libertarianism, he always has his philosophical anti-libertarianism to fall back on. Even if he were to give an empirical example, he would fall back on his philosophical anti-libertarianism. Libertarians cannot justify the thesis that they must always be right. For him, this is a damning criticism but then nobody can justify the thesis that they must always be right. For some reason, he doesn't apply this to himself. Only, it's only a problem for libertarians. Justificationism typically works this way. What I believe is of course justified because I'm reasonable and orthodox. Your wacky views have to be justified and we don't think you justified them. It leads to dogmatism, that's the problem with it. So we can again invert his accusation thus. Divine intervention might seem to be the only, th only thing that can make sense of this anti-libertarian straddle, the notion that one need not choose between a priori and a posteriori rationales for an anti-libertarian world. Although, of course, if one had to choose, one would choose the a priori rationale. I'm just saying to him what he is saying to us, to attempt to demonstrate how uh, silly it would sound to him, but it's the equivalent. 
Consistent with his justificationist approach, Friedman writes that occasionally Bose does make consequentialist arguments of sufficient generality to justify libertarianism, if they are sound. Uh, quite what to make of that, I don't know. Obviously, Friedman thinks they are not sound. Justificationists typically have higher standards of justification for other people. Friedman doubtless thinks that Desiriga is justified in his view that democracy is a spontaneous order. He quotes him as such. But as he does not give any argument to that effect, he simply points out that democracy is a, sponta is a spontaneous order in this, in this art long, long article. I merely note that democracy is proactively imposed on people and hence uh, it's very hard to even make sense of the idea that it could be spontaneous. And presumably Friedman also feels fully justified in asserting that there remain at the very least some public goods and in principle the need for economic redistribution. Which public goods? He doesn't mention any, simply taken as for granted that it's, it's been justified that there are. Why is there a need in principle for economic redistribution? We're not told. So it's impossible to reply. It's enough for Friedman, Friedman that he knows these things to be justified. It might be generally true, I don't know, that among libertarian economists there is a parallel conviction that a sound philosophical case for libertarianism has already been made by libertarian philosophers. However, this is certainly not true of all libertarian economists or of David Friedman in particular. David Friedman tends to scorn libertarian philosophy and presents only consequentialist arguments. Why does Jeffrey Friedman ignore this prominent, possibly the most prominent example? We then return to the justificationist era with Friedman's assertion that all of the painstaking research of Chicago and Austrian school economists cannot explain why every government regulation, let alone every government redistribution of wealth, would necessarily do more harm than good. So what? How can Jeffrey Friedman seriously complain about the absence of a logically necessary proof of the superiority of every possible libertarian policy? Near the end of his article, Friedman suggests that libertarians are precluded by their own ideology, which effectively celebrates whatever consumers freely choose as ipso facto good from criticising consumerism. Nobody is trapped in an ideology, although it might prompt him to a certain position at the start of an argument. It would be as idle to say that Friedman is precluded by his own anti-libertarian ideology from understanding certain things. Of course, Friedman is in a sense precluded by his philosophical and empirical uh, views from accepting libertarianism at any one moment, perhaps. But he's not precluded from coming to understand that these are errors, assuming they are so. Friedman, Jeffrey Friedman, has done some good service in emphasising the inadequacy of uh, a certain libertarian philosophical or a prioristic position. However, because of inadequacies in his own philosophical anti-libertarianism and his anti-libertarian straddle, whereby he'll use empirical arguments then, but then fall back on his own philosophical anti-libertarianism, nothing he has written in What's Wrong with Libertarianism is a threat to libertarianism uh, properly understood. Friedman has presented no argument and cited no evidence 
that even criticizes in all of the 25,000 words a uh, critical rationalist or non-justificationist or non-foundationalist libertarianism in the sense of people not proactively constraining each other. A fairly basic conception of liberty, I should have thought. I don't doubt that Friedman can, and I certainly hope he will, move on to non-justificationist anti-libertarianism. Well, uh, as I look through uh, Google Scholar today briefly, once I finally got my computer working again, uh, I, I, I noticed more anti-libertarian arguments and I uh, didn't notice anything that indicated anything to do with uh, a clearer conception of epistemology or a clearer conception of um, what libertarianism really is. Uh, and I very much doubt that he has it. But um, this is why philosophy matters. This academic has these two sort of key philosophical errors that cause him to misunderstand libertarianism and see it as uh, something which is indefensible because to defend it you'd have to justify it and he, he, he can't see how you can justify it uh, and he has some possibly high standards and consequently he talks uh, whenever he teaches libertarianism to his students uh, this is what they get so it matters that such philosophical errors uh, be answered and be understood to be answered However, in order to be understood, they have to be replied to, and that is a bit more difficult to get an American academic to reply to criticism from a non-academic <coughs> is uh, would be almost miraculous. Thank you. Okay. On, on the face of it, is um, criticisms of libertarianism seem stupid and pedantic. Uh, in, in, he seems to be impressed by libertarian ideas, but rejects them on the grounds that he thinks, probably right, that they're not absolutely fully justified, copper bottom, proven right in all the circumstances. Yeah. Now that might seem, and it certainly seems to you, to be a, a stupid demand. Yeah. But there are a lot of libertarians out there telling us that they do have absolutely justified, fully thought out, copper bottomed, absolutist justifications of libertarianism. Hence there's, a, there's a lot of them out there telling, oh, yeah. us, telling us that they do have this view. Yeah. And so it's a little bit deeper. It's not unreasonable to think that he's hit on something by showing them to be wrong. I completely agree. And I, I said at the beginning, I, uh, he is criticising some people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, but, but however, it's cri whilst their position is wrong, his, his criticisms uh, are partly wrong anyway mm. uh, by just making the opposite error. But yes, there is this poorly uh, worded version of libertarianism with uh, uh, some you know, confused philosophical background. And uh, well, he's doing us a favor by uh, helping to show that there's something wrong with it. That's good. He's also doing us a favor, assuming that we are libertarian or whatever uh, by drawing attention to libertarianism I mean uh, as I mentioned um, I think before we even started I mean uh, many people who will teach political philosophy in university may give libertarianism five or ten minutes out of the lecture on conservatism and just dismiss it that way but it would be wonderful it would be really wonderful I can hardly manage uh, imagine anything better if somebody was to devote a whole course to refuting libertarianism because in order to do that of course they'd have to go through it much more thoroughly and it would simply be a wonderful advertisement obviously uh, ultimately we want the truth so if libertarianism is wrong and somebody can come up with a refutation I mean I'd certainly like to hear it I mean if there's something fundamentally wrong and you know then it, or it has to be possibly not utterly rejected but you know modified in certain ways then you know let's let's hear the evidence so uh, but uh, I don't think he offers anything here you say he likes libertarianism well, I'm not so sure about that I mean 
No, he's impressed. I'd love to keep going on about it. Yes, Barbara, that's... <laughs> be, it's because Nozick put it on the map. Yes. Uh, uh, Nozick mentioned it, and therefore, not only is it respectable to discuss it, but it's, uh, you know, really necessary. It, 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 if you're a political philosopher, uh, you can't really ignore Nozick, you can't really ignore rules. Uh, so uh, that, but if, if it weren't for Nozick, I don't know whether libertarianism would be talked about in universities. Uh, I think David is right about this. It's just, we're still, we might be nowhere. So, uh, 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 of course, it didn't have to be uh, somebody like Nozick defending it or uh, propagating it. It, it. it might have been enough. For instance, if Nozick wrote a big book attacking libertarianism, that might have been almost as good. I don't know. It might even have been better. Uh, probably not, though. It's probably slightly better that uh, Nozick defended it, and so other people thought they had to attack it. Uh, uh, otherwise, they might go on the long on the basis that um, uh, you know, well, he's refuted it. Well, we agree, so there's nothing more to be said. Yeah. Uh, I think you're saying that uh, Jeffrey Friedman yeah. uh, gave a criticism of libertarianism because um, uh, he thought that the uh, the state was necessary because otherwise without it you'd have a failure of society because he was he was kind of blending politics and the social order as being one and the same thing. Yeah, for him, civil society is partly civilian and partly political. He, 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 I think only a, only a libertarian would really insist that civil society is is by definition not political society, and therefore they, you can't lump them together. Just and to clarify, could you quickly define for us what you think civil society is uh, by by contrast to, to what he thinks well, or what other people think? I mean, uh, uh, all social interactions which are completely voluntary and. Uh, not subsidised by taxation, not regulated by the state, no, uh, it, well, sometimes admit of degrees, but insofar as uh, what you're engaged in is uh, uh, simply people choosing to interact on a voluntary basis, that's civil society. So, so, so in a sense, politics is not society, it's anti-society. It, because it's, it's actually a war, yes, it's a war on society. Instead, here are all these voluntary uh, associations taking place and society socialising is a voluntary procedure and politics says, you can't do that. You, over there, give me that money because I like this activity and I'm going to subsidise this activity with your money. So it's, it's actually stopping society. It's an interference with society. Politi Where you have politics, society stops. Society is broke, breaks down. It actually replaces and is at war with society. The uh, idea that they're sort of wonderful, friendly, sort of melding, it's ridiculous. Politics is... a parasitic on and the enemy of society. Where there is society, there is no politics. Where there is politics, there is no society. Though I must admit they, uh, you know, they interweave to a considerable extent. But to some extent, surely you're always going to get uh, cliques and factions within society uh, that, that sort of uh, are quite committed to their own points of view and and want to evangelise for their particular you know, projects and, uh, and preferences. Um, is it possible for humans to get together without that part of our, our sort of uh, sociology coming into play? Uh, do we not need some sort of channels to, to, to sort of uh, direct that energy and direct that tendency of humans uh, in, a, in a safe way? Can you? Give me one concrete example of what you mean. I mean, I think I understand what you but would you, could anything spring to mind as a co concrete example? Well, I, th I think there is a tendency amongst people to, to get together and to organise, and there is certainly, uh, because of our, uh, sort of our 
evolutionary past, there's a tendency for us to, to come together and form uh, hierarchies where some person takes on the role of being a leader or spokesperson and other people act as, as sort of uh, subordinates and supporters and followers. Well, yeah, I mean, that could be in a business or it could be in a club or but what's the problem? I mean, uh, if, as long as it is all voluntary. I mean, if it uh, here is, a, you know, um, dance classes and they, they're ranked according to ability and somebody's in charge of them and not just anybody can join, uh, but uh, it's all entirely voluntary and the, uh, the hall is hired and nobody is into, no, you know, you might want to join and you're not allowed to join, but what they're doing there is withholding something from you which is a benefit they're not actually taking anything from you that's yours or proactively constraining you in any way they're just not giving you something you want but that kind of hierarchy I, uh, uh, um, is a uh, it's not a political hierarchy i mean there's no literal archy or rule in, in the sense of archy is originally political and it means you will do this or else and that you know you will be forced to do it or you know you'll be imprisoned or killed uh, in dance classes or whatever you may have a hierarchy but there's nothing like that I mean, it's a, it's a it, it's uh there are levels um but it's not it's a different kind of thing i know it's just well, it's no it's not a threat it's a solution it's a uh, sometimes you do need people to be in charge nothing would ever get done unless some people were in charge. In a business, how could you have... Isn't, I, don't, I don't think even the co-op runs on a democratic basis, or John Lewis, you know, how... What a, it, there's a very definite hierarchy of the bosses and, you know, your allotted spot, and if you do well, you might move up or you might move down if you do badly. But uh, it's, it's that. So you can... Hierarchy, in that sense, uh, is a solution. Uh, hierarchy is only a problem when it's political. Yeah, but if, 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 they, if they don't allow you to, to leave... Oh, I mean, so it's, 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 it's cool. No, uh, no, I mean, if, if they don't allow you to leave... What, and, the dance class? Or which? Or whatever. No, not a dance class, but maybe <laughs> maybe a cult or, or whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah. And if, if also, but then it becomes kind of political, but without having a state. Isn't it? Um, well, you see, it partly depends... Uh, you say they don't allow you to leave. Um, an interesting case here would be um, apostasy, which, according to some interpretations of Islam, I don't know if it's completely agreed to. If you say, I want to give up Islam, then you have to be killed as an apostate. You're not allowed to give it up. Now, uh, from a libertarian point of view, I would say you can't do this just be because somebody was born into the religion but if once you've reached um, the age of um, majority you know you're, we regard you as an adult if you then sign a contract saying if you ever leave then you can be killed then uh, I suppose that has to be tolerated I don't think it's a good thing uh, but, uh, but, uh, but um, you know you can bind yourself by, by, I mean, if we're going to have contracts at all, then we have to be able to bind ourselves in those contracts. <laughs> yeah, but I would strenuously object to that. I would, I would, when I, I, I would agree with everything you've said, really, up until... until it's that. controversial. Uh, Specific no, it's, performance, it's not, yeah. it's not at all controversial. It's assuming you have the right of life and death over someone else. But nobody has the right of life and death or the right of compulsion over other people. Uh, the, the worst you can do, yeah. if I break a contract with is say that I broke a contract with you, uh, and then you deprive me of any benefits that I get from the contract. So well, what about you have no right yeah. retaining over the, the yeah. contract uh, to, to my life? Otherwise, you're you're basically uh, entirely denying my liberty. Uh, I I have a reputation to maintain. I have an interest uh, in maintaining my reputation and maintaining good relations with other people. Uh, and my sort of uh, interest in doing that is the only encouragement I need to keep my contracts. It's, <coughs> if you make a contract with me uh, that uh, is so uh, arduous uh, that 
I'm put in a position where I really have to choose uh, whether or not I'm going to sort of um, uh, actually live my life and fulfill my own choices or give up everything that I want and just do what you want. You effectively turn me into a slave. Uh, and and that is that is completely against liberty. You can't expect me, you can't reasonably expect me to maintain that kind of contract. Right. Suppose I'm a billionaire and um, I know I've got a problem with my liver and at some point I'm going to need another one. And um, I say to 10 people who've been tested and they've all got compatible livers, um, I'm only ever going to need one once and even then not you know, I, maybe I won't, the doctors say, but there's a good chance I might. But when I need it, I'm going to need it quickly. And uh, so all 10 of you, I'll give you a million pounds each if you sign this contract of specific performance that when I need it, I can have it. But you don't have to sign the contract if you don't want to. And, and even if I, my liver does fail, and it might not, there's only a one in 10 chance that it will be you, but you'll get that million pounds. Now, I can't see why that would be illegitimate for you to sign that contract, or if you did sign the contract, it would be illegitimate for me to insist on specific performance. Uh, and, and even, now, it, it might not necessarily even kill you because you could, might be able to survive by getting another kind of transplant yourself or something like that. But uh, So it's, when I say it's controversial, what I meant was the, the specific performance is controversial, but if you don't allow contracts that include specific performance, uh, it seems um, ex ante people will be worse off. Uh, they, 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 they won't make contracts that would be to their mutual benefit. I understand what you're, what you're saying there. Yeah. Uh, I, I disagree because I think that people should always have the, the freedom to, to breach a contract. Yeah. Uh, breaching a contract is, again, uh, another part of liberty. Uh, so so even, if, even, if, if, even if the contract is one of specific performance, and I say, look, not a million then, I'll give you 10 million as long as you agree to specific performance. The, the amount of money is not an issue. No? The point is that it basically binds the other person into to a slave. Well, no, so no, not slavery. No, 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 no. It's not you're not a slave. Always, it's just it binds you to do what you've said that you'll do. Yeah, but you can always you're breach a contract. Slave, actually. You can it's, always breach a contract and then ask yeah. for, for economic compensation. In that case, you have to give Well, no, no, no. It depends. Um, most contracts are and always will be uh, uh, much more gentle and simply have uh, some kind of uh, penalty clause which will probably be financial but there will occasionally be rare cases where it's in the interest of one party strongly that he has specific performance for instance let's let something the other way around um, uh, I need a doctor to operate on me or I'm going to die, and so I say to these various doctors, when when I eventually this disease gets the better of me, and I need somebody in a hurry, one of you, my security men, is going to come and grab you and make you perform the operation on me to keep me alive. Uh, does that then sound so terrible? And I'm paying you all a million pounds to put up with the possibility that you might be dragged out of the opera or whatever to perform the operation. Well, that's all. We'll, you'll be made to perform the operation for which you've got that money and you've signed the contract. I can't see why specific performance ne is that onerous or that terrible. Or I, I do actually disagree. I think that people should always have the freedom to, to break their contracts. Well, then there won't be contracts of specific performance. Then they won't exist. But that will mean that uh, the, the billionaire will die and all, or the people he would have paid a million pounds to won't get their million pounds. Everybody will be worse off. Well... I mean, that's, that's a uh, uh, but but uh, and what's more, not only will they be worse off, but they might all want to have this, and you from the outside are telling them they can't have it. I'm they've what they want. They want to contract I'm, in, I'm, and you're saying they're not allowed to. I'm not no, telling you, you can make not, the I'm not telling you they're not allowed to. What I'm saying is that 
even if they've made the contract, they should always have the choice of breaching the contract. Yeah. So there should never be any contract that is absolutely binding because it is then slavery. You can then say that this social contract is unbreachable and, I, and you can't break it. So what social contract? The social contract that we've presumably all agreed to. I don't ah. agree that it exists. Ah. But if you're saying that it's okay to, to impose, you know, for these contracts to be presumed to be unbreakable, uh, then we have no grounds on right. which to object. I actually, to I actually, contract yeah. already in place. This, uh, the idea of a social contract is possibly a bit more relevant to the Friedman here. Uh, I can make sense of uh, a tacit social contract uh, when you uh, interact with people normally. There is a presumption that you're not going to kill them or rob them or rape them or what, and they're not going to do it to you. And that's why, as we go about our uh, lives, shopping or uh, working or whatever, uh, we don't do it with great sort of fear and circumspection that somebody's going to get, you know, try and deliberately. Uh, get the better of us or do something terrible to us anyway. We, we sort of understood that I'm not going to attack you and you're not going to attack me. And that is a sort of um, thing that, that everybody tacitly understands. As, so as people walk up and down the high street, nobody is particularly worried, even though they know that some big fellow could grab them and take their money if he wanted to, and possibly even, it's, they sort of know that well, we don't do that. And we all know that we don't do it, and it's that's why I say, in a sense, it's a tacit, it's a tacit contract. It depends, but then you can you make sense of a tacit contract? I can, I think. Uh, but I may, I and I, my idea of a tacit contract would be, uh, it, uh, along the lines of when you go to a restaurant and you sit down and you order your food, you don't sign a piece of paper saying I agree to pay afterwards, or you just understood. It's just tacit. That that's what you're doing there. You're you're going to. So similarly, when you interact with somebody, you don't have to write it down, or it's understood that you're not going to attack each other. Uh, uh, and in that sense, I think there is a tacit social contract. And it's and what's more, there's a tacit social contract that politics interferes with because politics has all these people interacting on a voluntary stick back way and, and stops it, stops interferes. So uh, the, the, the political contract, of course, is Hobbes. Hobbes. Hobbes contract theory is not a social contract theory. It's a political contract theory. Locke's contract theory is a social contract theory. And they're completely different things, though sometimes people talk about contract theory as though it's the one thing. But again, if you once you distinguish politics from society, you see that these are utterly different contracts. One is a uh, uh, one contract doesn't exist. I don't think there is anything like a political contract, but a social, tacit social contract. I think there is. I mean, I again, uh, sorry, I'm. Uh, well, we'll, uh, come, we'll come back to you, yeah. Paul, yeah. and then we'll come back to you. Yeah, just on, on specific performance, just an interesting <laughs> academic curiosity that um, there was a, an unusual division between Rothbard and Walter Block on this. Yeah. Uh, Rothbard was against this performance. Yes. His vicar on earth, Walter Block, uh, was in favour of it, and that was a, an unusual point of substantive disagreement between them. Yeah. And it also occurs to me that... The I, only thing they ever disagreed well, on. <laughs> they didn't disagree on much, but it also occurs to me, you could, uh, if, if Europe were fully libertarian, you could run a very good business um, sending out libertarian ships into the Mediterranean and catching all these migrants and getting them to sign indentured servitude contracts uh, before, yeah. we, before we rescue them. No, no, because that's not... No, 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 that's not, you see... So, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that you see, that's not quite the same thing as a slave, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll rescue you if you sign up to these conditions. Yeah, yeah liver, kidney, specific performance. I, yeah, know, uh, it seems to be. Uh, it, it, chances, mate, I mean, if somebody's <laughs> drowning, you say, well, you know, I will save you if you work for me for ten years. Uh, I won't, I won't harm you. I'll feed you, but. I, when I won't, well, I would it's, say. It's certainly more slavery. Certainly more uh, uh, you think that's slavery? Is it, uh, anyway, I would say, uh, and, and, if you, and if they won't sign the contract, say, okay, carry on drowning, mate. I didn't put you in there. <laughs> you know, so I, that's why I say ex ante, everybody gains from these contracts, so why hate them? Anyway, uh, I, I'm the, not the, saying the they're question, lovely. The question I wanted to ask, though, yeah. was, apart from those points, it was a distraction, was uh, Jeffrey Friedman, uh, he spends a lot of time being an anti libertarian. Yes. But what are, what are his opposed 
positive substantive views? Is he does he want just a little bit of state? Oh, he wants he, he, out he, he wants yeah he, he wants a lot of redistribution. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and he doesn't like some of the results of the market and this commercial. So he thinks we worship the, the results. Of course, uh, the idea that libertarians worship the market is um, false in at least two ways. I mean, firstly, uh, the free market, whilst very important uh, and part of libertarianism, is only a part of it. The, the, the other part, which I suppose has at least equal weight, if not more, is all the personal stuff that you shouldn't interfere with people in their personal lives as long as they're in, and it, which have, don't have any market interactions at all. They simply, they're, they want to take drugs or who they want to sleep with or that, all that sort of stuff. Um, that's at least as much a part of libertarianism. But the, uh, the other way in which it is mistaken is um, Libertarianism is more about what should be tolerated rather than what should necessarily be celebrated. I, if I think people should be allowed to smoke, I'm not saying that smoking is wonderful and I, 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 I that's crazy. I mean, just it's just people should be allowed to if they want to. People should be allowed to follow their religions as long as those religions don't endanger other people in any way. Uh, but I don't think. I don't think it's good. In fact, uh, there are many things I think the market uh, will produce that I hate, but I think you have to tolerate them because, um, in turn, you know, there are things that you want to do on the market that other people might not like, but you want to be tolerated because it's part of liberty that it be tolerated. And uh, toleration is not respect, uh, let alone celebration. Uh, but a toleration is all that we, is reasonable to ask of other people. It, uh, it's completely unreasonable and impossible to ask people to respect you or insist that they respect you. You can't respect everybody and anybody, especially when they're uh, uh, terrible people <laughs> who are doing absurd and stupid things that you can't help but disrespect. But you can tolerate them doing whatever those things are as long as it's in a voluntaristic framework. So so it's far from praising everything that comes out of the market, We're, you know, being market, market worshippers, which is how Friedman depicts us. It's, no, it's, you know, there are pros and cons to the market, but it, it, it's, it's better to tolerate the consequences of the market than it is to t tolerate interference with the market, because those consequences are worse. Yeah. yeah, you talked before about the presumption behind uh, compliance and the passiveness before saying that you know, if, you, if you're meeting someone for the first time, you, you, you assume that they're not going to attack yes. or, or, or force something. Yeah. But that is kind of a, that is a function of, and that's it, it's a sort of a, a special case, really, because that, that has been created by civilization. I mean, yes. I, I mean, if I, if I come up to you yeah. and if I shake your hand, yeah. Or, or, better, or even if I wave to you, yeah. what it actually means, um, and this was invented, you know, in a in a pre-civilization yeah. society, that I'm not armed. Oh yeah. And if I shake your hand, and if I actually shake it, the then reason behind it actually has a utility. It's, it's you, you haven't know, got a sword in your hand or, or a gun or I don't yeah. Have a knife up my yeah. Sleeve. Yeah. Uh, so it's a it's in that society, which is kind of the purest society with not a lot of law. You're still, you yeah. can't assume anything. That's the reason why all these things were invented. Yeah. Well, they've evolved, really. I mean, they've they, uh, they, yeah, they lost, they've kind of lost their meaning. They've become tradition. They've become yeah. uh, just a way of greeting someone. They're, they're, they're part of yeah. showing that, 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 that we are part of this social contract. When you show that you are yeah, uh, an unthreatening. But it's, actually show, it's actually showing, though, because now, that back then, you couldn't assume anything. Well, uh, the guy actually might, might have a, yeah, might I mean, it depends how far back you go. But I mean, uh, from what I read, almost every society, if you go back far enough, not only practiced slavery, but before that practiced cannibalism. Oh, yeah. And uh, 
you know, so uh, and, 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 uh, some of it was xenophobic and some of it wasn't even xenophobic, it, even eat, eating your own. I think there were some societies that, that uh, practiced cannibalism and eating the enemies and so on and so forth. But if you look at the societies that actually practice it today and actually have, have that have it as a tradition where they actually eat their own dead and everything, they become uncompetitive. Uh, actually, no, I'll, I'll well, because they, because they, 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 there was well, cannibalism well, in well, North well, Korea. Yeah, uh, they, they, uh, well, I, but they were starving and they practiced cannibalism that's out, because out of, and, out, of out of necessity. Yeah, it's out of necessity, but rather than out of m malice, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, we progress, but but this evolved. Uh, the the idea that it's better to cooperate, especially on a repeated basis, rather than to attack. Uh, that 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 is, is, is yes, it's an evolved idea society has evolved as the idea that voluntary interaction is a better way of interacting with other people uh, uh, on a, on an iterated basis as something that is, is evolved uh, any law maybe comes later and of course law isn't necessarily part of the state it can simply be Culture. some uh, yeah so these the, the the elders will uh, uh, rule on any dispute between two people uh, as to regards who is in the right or something so there's law there but there's no state there and it's all within a it's, it's uh, there's arbitration within a voluntaristic basis uh, well no 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 it's not I don't know because uh, um, where you have law it doesn't follow that you have a state if it, you can if you've got voluntary arbitration again uh, if, so, uh, if somebody's a statist, they say, oh, there you are, there's, that's a state. No, it isn't. Voluntary arbitration is nothing like a state. It's, it's, it's you choose to settle your difference by going to this group of people and putting your evidence. At no point is anybody forced into it. At no point is anybody taxed to pay for it. It's, it, it's voluntaristic. Now, I think the origins of law are, you know, in this voluntary arbitration. People see that it works and they want it. And, and if the state got out of the way, there'd be more of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it they'd probably still call it law because they want to. And, uh, uh, but uh, it would be, people would also contract in, of course. Uh, you know, uh, they, they would sign contracts saying if, uh, now I'm not sure how this fits with specific performance, but they might say, if I'm ever caught doing the following things, I agree to the following penalties, uh, which might include incarceration. Now, uh, I don't know where, how that would fit in, I would, which I would then say is, fair enough. <laughs> You've agreed that you can be incarcerated if you commit such and such a, a crime, uh, and now you're being incarcerated. Uh, uh, for me, that it, that would be part of specific performance. And so, if you resist, then, it's, then you lose your standing in society. There is, there's that as well. Yes, I mean there are all sorts of uh, of, of ways of regulating uh, 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 society that have evolved that are voluntary and non-political, and uh, they're more efficient because they are voluntary and non-political. And of course, they become more sophisticated over time, and they started. I said, there wasn't a lot, when there was cannibalism and slavery, it, there wasn't an awful lot of uh, sophistication socially. Uh, and it, and it, and it, but it's grown, and it's grown no thanks to the state. Of course, people like Pinker want a, the state to take all the credit for the, for the fact that there's less violence in society. Uh, I, I think actually it's... Uh, I go along with um, the guy who wrote about uh, democide. Um, it depends upon what scale you uh, Yeah, who's the guy who wrote about democide? Who, uh, uh, he wrote the University of Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, and he, he, you know, I think I mean I say this, I think this, uh, Pinker is exactly wrong on this. It's the state is far more productive, and of course the state monopolizes the law in a, and policing. In an incredibly inefficient way, and in a way which is itself also criminal, <laughs> taking money from people who don't want to uh, subsidise the judicial system and the policing system, and then giving them a lousy. Uh, the idea that the, that the, we've got, because it's an inherently conservative idea, if it wasn't for the state holding it all together, society would just fall to pieces. Rubbish. The state is a parasite. Yeah. 
that's disrupting it at every bloody stage, and it, we would have competing private agencies. I think it's a modern conservative idea, but I think, you, like, I think a true conservative idea. You know, the reason I'm attracted to this sort of thinking is that um, the more freedom that you have, the more responsible you are. Because you know, just going back to my previous uh, point, is if, if you're if you're going to have to be thinking about is this guy actually going to attack me or not, you're going to be making the right decisions if you if you realize that you uh, that you've only got one um, liver or something, only only one life to live, and that there's no there's no going to be no safety net, no status safety net, then you're going to be incredibly responsible. Like, so I'm going to, I'm going to make the right decisions, and that's why myself as a and, and I believe uh, social conservatism mm -hmm. is the survival strategy for working in a, uh, the most free conditions. Mm. That, that's, that's the reason I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to this way of thinking. This, this you mean what, social conservatism? Yeah, so, so tradition. Uh, you know, the, the well, see, people, people just think that yeah. tradition just kind of was made up. It was just kind of imposed yeah. because some guy was oh, yeah. uh, annoyed at everyone. I mean, in, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a survival mm -hmm. strategy for... In the sense of, um, uh, uh, of there being yeah. evolved rules yeah. which have evolved because they work mm -hmm. and exactly. we want to yeah. and we want to we want to conserve yeah. those rules it's i mean it's uh, we we're not just going to say oh who cares about marriage who cares about being polite who cares about shaking forget all that rob well they've evolved and they're actually helping society go along uh, in a way that uh, works, but and, uh, in that sense of conservatism, I think conservatism is fine. It's only the political sense of conservatism, yeah. which is, again, it's, I would, it's, that is a completely different thing. Like they're uh, in a conservative party now, they're trying to, uh, you know, instill the good morality in the people, and there is that, there is that uh, undercurrent there. But they're trying to use it, the, the force of the state to do it. Yes. A lot of the time. Yeah, Rather I mean, just yeah, yeah. These things happen and grow in a, on yeah. precedent. In a sense, they do want to conserve certain things, perhaps, but, but they, they want to preserve, it. conserve it. They want to conserve what they think is good yeah. at other people's expense, yeah, exactly. and, rather than voluntarily yeah. conserve. Yeah, that's and really so, yeah, so uh, uh, so political conservatism in a broad, not just we're not just referring to the Conservative Party, but yeah. the conservative All political all conservatism, all of yeah. course, yes, is is completely different from conservatism in this social sense, which is I can say that we can, can be sympathetic to. And, uh, uh, and uh, it sort of has Hayekian, uh, uh, you can give, explain it in a Hayekian way. Yeah. Um, no, I'm fine, thanks. So fine. Pat? If we come to the end now, carry on. Carry on. Just, just, just a couple of things very quickly. Right. Very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Idea, Are you a cannibal? The, the idea <laughs> that there are millions of people standing every yep. year, and there are also millions of people dying. I mean, surely, surely from an atheist perspective, the answer to that is to let the uh, people <laughs> have no prayer. Dying. Yep. I mean, the only, can I just say, the, the, only first, the only people stopping them from doing that, from their perspective, yeah. <laughs> Are these lunatics with their imaginary friend who they say, well, their imaginary friend said they can't do that? Yeah, well, I think that the shibboleth against eating dead people, uh, uh, well, sorry, it's not the shibboleth, a taboo, rather, it's a taboo, is probably a good one because eating dead people who've died of natural causes. It's probably a bad habit to get into because then <laughs> you start looking around saying, well, you know, it's black, can we just push him a bit over, the, you know. <laughs> then you start looking for people who haven't died of natural causes. So in that sense, now you might say from a libertarian point of view, if people really want to uh, eat dead people or possibly even, as has been the case in the newspapers, voluntarily eat, present themselves to be eaten in part or in whole, possibly for sexual reasons or who knows what, then I suppose it has to be tolerated. But um, this is the sort of thing where I might want to say, not in my street, thank you very much. So, well, uh, uh, 
There is a sense in which, you know, gambling, prostitution, and whatever have to be tolerated, but not necessarily in the area where you live, because you can say, I moved into this area where all these things are banned, they're allowed over there, go over there and do them. And so I, so I think even though at the extreme, it might, I don't think, for instance, there's ever going to be a cannibal restaurant in Covent Garden, even though they have sold human breast milk there, but there wasn't much demand for it. Well, uh, just, just quickly on that one, I can see what you mean. Yeah. It, it doesn't really hold up the argument. I to give you a simple Doesn't it? Example, oh. Just, just, no, just, just a simple example. Yeah. Um, the Muslims don't eat pork, Jews don't eat pork. Neither do Muslims, simple, yeah. The simple reason for that is that when you put back that, because pigs would eat anything, including sewage, they were usually infected with diseases, pigs. That's, but nowadays, yeah. is, I say, well, well, down you can do that without any problem. It's yeah. part of progress. So you still, still <laughs> as we progress, we will eat people. But they still held that in their old tradition. We'll clean them of whatever kills them. Yeah. No, hang on a minute. Yeah, yeah, we've got another speaker. This is a bit about cannibalism again. Um, yeah. there is, just, this is making me hungry. <laughs> there, there is a, a tribe that's, that's in the middle of the Amazon jungle, and it is part of their culture to eat their own dead. And they are still around today. Yeah. But the problem is the, the reason why you're saying it's probably not a good idea to eat human dead for whatever reason. The reason is because the human body is not designed to process human uh, flesh alone. Are so, you sure? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Understand because it's called long pig uh, 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 by some tribes that eat it because it's supposed to take just like pork. But, but what it does is that it starts to affect your mind. All oh, the no. It starts to build up. Kuru. The disease Kuru, which is related to Creutzfeldt, Jakob's disease, is caused by eating brains, uh, which of course are deliciously sweet, I'm told. How, it's, it's so don't possible. eat the brains and you'll be okay. But it's also the flesh, the flesh, the human flesh of, it, of, the, of uh, the dead humans. It's, uh, what it does is that it, it, the toxins build up. Well, well this is news to me. I mean, it might be true, but yeah, I haven't heard this. Well, yeah. I've seen it on a documentary. But oh, okay. It <laughs> must be true. Okay, I don't. But, yeah. um, the toxins build up in the elders' society because they've uh, in, the, in the elders of the society because they've eaten the most dead people. That's why we've got to eat the young ones. <laughs> but, but what happens though is that they're they're eating all sorts of things, right? Um, the toxins build up in their brain and they start to develop this disease where they kind of fall into maniacal laughter, just yes. out of uh, purely spont spontaneous, uh, yeah, uh, purely spontaneous. So it it, it has that. It kind of it, it retards their uh, mental function, so if you eventually you have your elders that are just kind of sitting there yeah. laughing to themselves, so they are. Uh, it becomes a degenerate society. Yeah. Well, even if even if eating other people was healthy, has, was healthy, was healthy, I'd still be against it. On the basis that once you it, uh, it's a slippery slope, I mean, it's a slippery. As I said, once you've accustomed people to the idea. It, how long is it going to be before people start disappearing and bits of them start appearing in people's larders, like uh, Sweeney Todd? Oh, yeah. I, don't, so I, I think sometimes we, we don't want to start down a slippery slope. It's, it's just, just a modest that. proposal, Jonathan Swift. Yes, Jonathan so Swift's the, the modest proposal the Irish family. Yeah, is that they, the young, and uh, he talked about a completely delicious 16-year-old girls, very plump, but also babies, you know. <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, of course, he was being ironic. Are we going to have a one last one from yeah, Patrick? Just, 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 quickly, just, just a yeah. point of information. I mean, quite recently, in a BBC cookery program, <laughs> yes. they were cooking in the flesh. Now, I must have read that. It was on the news. On, the no. the <laughs> on a BBC cookery program. <laughs> They were cooking. Yeah, I think, the, I think, the, I think the we should repeal their license. For you are you're talking about the presenter or something? Yes. Okay, right. Now, there was yeah. a big outcry against it. Yeah. It's apparently with the upper classes, not so much with the working on the upper class. They would never do that. But apparently, the upper classes is quite a, a common thing to do. <laughs> yes, but then, <laughs> but, but, yeah. but they're all, <laughs> but Patrick, they, they're all lizards, aren't they? Aren't they? <laughs> Who's <laughs> telling you all these things, Pat? <laughs> the newspapers, the red top.
Anyway. It forms the next thing of Downton Abbey. Well, then let's carry on. Are we, uh, uh, we delighted people uh, enough? Then, yes, I think so. Thank you for coming. I hope you come next week. Uh, next month, rather. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.